to. Okay, I thought he was going to make an intimation. Um, a, a, <coughs> at the end uh, of this session, we have a question and answer session. So uh, that can be questions from what I'm going to say, or it can be any other questions as well. Uh, questions from what David has said or whatever. <coughs> Okay, um, so the, the handout uh, I, I've given you is, is, is pretty well uh, where we will be going, um, and, and it's more for yourselves for later on. Rob, did you want to say anything more about the question and answer session than I, I, I said, just that it can be from this and it can yeah, be from what David yeah, said. Can just be. say, think of your questions while you're listening. <coughs> Okay, the um, topic for today is the Holy Spirit in the life and ministry of Jesus. And uh, just this topic, it, it's something that actually has come up uh, this semester in discussions with uh, uh, some students. Uh, so I thought it might be helpful for us to, to have a look at. How is it that uh, Jesus was able to do miracles? Wonderful miracles, many miracles, <coughs> uh, exercising demons, healing people, all kinds of sickness and disease, feeding multitudes of people with very little, raising the dead. How was Jesus able to do all of these miracles? I suspect that... Uh, like many Christians, perhaps even most Christians, your gut reaction to that question would be to say, well, he was the son of God. Uh, and this is really asking, this lecture is about asking the question, is that the answer? Is that the Bible's answer? Is it the right answer? Is it as simple as that? One is, first of all, uh, as we try to uh, unpack this whole question, uh, to look at uh, other human beings who did miraculous things. And they have been there right through out the, the Old Testament and uh, the New Testament. Let's think, first of all, uh, of some folks from the Old Testament. How did Moses and some of the other great prophetic figures, Elijah and Elisha, how did they perform miracles? They weren't deities. They weren't persons in the Godhead. But they managed to do miraculous things. Some of them on a par with uh, the miracles that we find in the New Testament. Or the miracles of, of Jesus. So does that help us to answer our question? Is there any difference between what Jesus was doing and what Moses was doing? For example, uh, Moses in Acts chapter 7, you remember that's where uh, Stephen gives us a kind of uh, uh, short history, uh, uh, an overview of the history of the Old Testament. Uh, in verse 36 of uh, Acts 7, uh, uh, Stephen tells us that uh, uh, Moses was one who led the Israelites out of Egypt and did wonders and miraculous signs in Egypt at the Red Sea and for 40 years in the desert. And if you're familiar with the books of Exodus through uh, Deuteronomy, you'll um, be aware of many of these signs and wonders. Uh, amongst uh, the most marvelous of them, I suppose, are the, the plagues, the miraculous plagues uh, that we read of. Um, in Exodus 7 through to 14. Every time Moses uh, held out his hand with uh, the staff that God had given him, a miracle happened. It became a plague uh, for the Egyptians. Many centuries later, Elijah raised the dead. The widow of Serephim's dead son. Or at least God did that great miracle through Elijah, through his actions and in response to his prayer. 
And then that's 1 Kings 17. Into the next chapter, the great <laughs> conflict uh, that David was talking about, uh, that's there at the heart of the Old Testament as well. Uh, the, the clash of the kingdoms. Uh, the clash for the worship, um, for, for, for the heart of God's people. And Elijah calls down the fire of God from heaven. Uh, having already doused the sacrifice uh, with copious amounts of water, stacking the cards against him, as it were. After Elijah came Elisha, he threw some <clears throat> salt uh, into uh, water that was stagnant or whatever, and the water was healed. He threw a stick into a river where uh, an iron axe head had fallen and it floated. Uh, and he also raised the dead, in his case, the son of a Shunammite woman, and so on. And he uh, fed crowds of people on very limited supplies as well. So Jesus wasn't the first to do that. How did these ordinary human beings? who were, uh, as James reminds us in James chapter 5, just like us. We probably don't think of uh, Elijah and Moses and Elisha as just like us, but they were just like us. So how did these human beings just like us perform such miracles? Was it not by the power of God working through them? Uh, Moses acknowledges that um, just after the, the crossing of the Red Sea and that great song of uh, Moses, the song of salvation, <clears throat> the, uh, the original redemption song, uh, Exodus 15, verse 6. He speaks to God uh, or worships uh, God. Your right hand, O Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand shattered the enemy. You blew with your breath, Hebrew Ruach, possibly spirit. The spirit of God there in the sea uh, covered them. And even um, Pharaoh's magicians had to acknowledge uh, after some of the plagues, which uh, some of the earlier ones they were able to replicate, but some of the others, they, they came a stage when they weren't able to replicate uh, the miracles, and they had to confess Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. So again and again, Moses stretched out his right hand, but it was God's right hand that moved. It was God's right hand that was working. Although if you look very closely at the text, you'll see that uh, uh, the work of God is described in many different ways. Sometimes it's the word of God uh, that, that acts. Uh, sometimes it's uh, the breath or the ruach, the spirit of God. Sometimes the finger of God, or the hand of God, or the arm of God, or the, or the power of God. And we remember, of course, um, that Moses was a man upon whom the spirit of God uh, rested permanently. Uh, we read of that in uh, Numbers chapter 11. <clears throat> and probably the same could be said then of um, Elijah and Elisha. Though I think it, in their cases it wasn't uh, stated quite so explicitly, but I've given you, I think, some texts here that we'll have a look at uh, afterwards. So, that's the Old Testament prophets. What about uh, the New Testament and uh, the, the apostles of, of Jesus? Uh, they were sent out by Jesus, first of all, uh, we read in the Gospels, uh, to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And as signs uh, that that kingdom of God that Jesus himself preached about, uh, as signs of the inbreaking of that kingdom, uh, Jesus commanded them to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, <coughs> drive, uh, drive out demons. And they were able to perform such miracles uh, not only when Jesus was uh, with them and when they were under that direct instruction of, of, of Jesus, but after the resurrection and his ascension and um, after the day of Pentecost. 
And we read there on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2 and verse 23, many wonders and miraculous signs were done by these apostles. And there's no doubt that the empowerment for, uh, for all of that, post-Pentecost at least, came from the Spirit of God. Poured out in a very special way, a new way, a, a unique way on the day of Pentecost. Poured out by Christ from on high. From his exalted and glorified position on high. So as you go through the book of Acts, you can think of uh, Peter's healing of the cripple at the gate beautiful in the, in the city of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 3. Or later on, you come to uh, that apostle born out of time, as it were, Paul and uh, Barnabas in Acts chapter 14. Uh, verse 3, we read, they spent considerable time in Iconium speaking boldly for the Lord and the Lord confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. So often the signs and wonders, of course, were confirmations of the words that were being spoken, the words about uh, the coming of the kingdom. And later in Acts 15, uh, when mm -hmm. Paul and Barnabas are before the, uh, the council uh, at Jerusalem, uh, we read there in verse 12, them telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among them, uh, them uh, among the Gentiles through them. And later on, in one of his own letters, Paul, uh, in Romans chapter 15 and verse 19, he attributes the, um, the empowering for all of these signs and wonders that he and Barnabas and the other apostles were able to do uh, to the uh, Holy Spirit by the power of signs and miracles through the power of the Spirit. But it wasn't just uh, the apostles who were able to do that. I don't think Stephen is ever uh, called an apostle. Maybe uh, David can correct me on that one. But uh, um, certainly when we see him, first of all, in Acts uh, chapter 6, he's set apart from, uh, uh, separate, set apart as one of the, we might call them, the deacons of the early church, and set apart for that role to enable the apostles to get on with uh, their priorities, which were not miraculous signs, but prayer and the ministry of the word. But in Acts 6 and verse 8, uh, Stephen is described as a man full of God's grace and power and as one who did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. And miracles weren't just the remit of the apostles or individuals like Stephen. There are indications here and there uh, from Paul's letters and some of the other uh, letters in the New Testament, that uh, miracles were known within um, the first generation churches, uh, at least for some of them. <clears throat> the church in Corinth, uh, some of its members were imbued, well all of its members were imbued with the Holy Spirit, but some of them imbued with the gifts of healing uh, and miraculous powers by the Spirit. The churches in Galatia, um, we read something similar of them, although it just comes out kind of incidentally in the passing when Paul is talking about something else. Galatians 3 and verse 5, he says, God gave his spirit and worked miracles uh, among them. And in James 5, uh, though the spirit is not specifically referred to there, the reference is to anointing with oil. And we know from Old Testament um, that... Um, Oil, the yeah, anointing oil is uh, anointing with oil is often associated with uh, anointing with the spirit. Uh, that's what happened in the experience of uh, Saul and David, uh, for example. And there's uh, 14 of James 5. Is any of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. Pray for each other that you may be healed. When was the last time you did that in your church? I heard it done uh, in your church. So in, in each and every uh, such New Testament reference, it's clear that the empowerment for signs and wonders and miracles came from the Spirit who had been poured out at Pentecost. So it's quite clear then uh, from the Scriptures, both of the Old Testament and the New Testament, that miraculous signs and wonders are not in themselves an indication that the day of, of, 
of, of the deity of the person performing the, uh, the miracle. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament, ordinary people, ordinary human beings like ourselves, redeemed human beings but still sinful human beings like ourselves, uh, were empowered by God to do great and miraculous feats. But then of Jesus. Is it necessarily because he was God the Son that Jesus was able to do these amazing miracles? Well, clearly not. It's not uh, a necessity. That still leaves open the possibility that Jesus chose to operate in this kind of way. So secondly, I, I want us to have a, a, a closer look at Jesus' own teaching and, uh, and, and the teaching of some of the, uh, the New Testament writers. And the clearest teaching that we have from the lips of, of Jesus on this is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12. Uh, so I want to read um, some of that. Uh, Matthew 12, from verse 22 onwards. Then they brought to Jesus a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. So triple problems. Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It's only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can rob his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven, men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. And so on. So Jesus uh, heals this demon-possessed, <coughs> blind, mute man. And what was the response of the people, of those who, who were around at that time? Well, the, the, the response of most of them uh, who witnessed the miraculous event was fairly typical of uh, the crowds around Jesus when they witnessed these things. It was one of astonishment. They, it was, these things were wonders. And so they wondered. Uh, they marvel at what was before them and they start asking questions. Is this, could this possibly be the son of David? In other words, is this the Messiah? Is this the Messianic king uh, that we've been waiting for all those centuries? And then, of course, there were the Pharisees. And they had a different uh, drumbeat going. Different response. It's the, it's the devil. It's of the devil. Beelzebub, the prince of demons. It's only, verse 24, it's only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this, uh, that this fellow drives out demons. Uh, it, it looks as if uh, that's what they were saying amongst themselves, or saying in their hearts, and uh, uh, Jesus immediately discerned um, uh, what they were saying, and he addressed their thoughts directly, and showed the absurdity of their position. And then he speaks in verse 28. But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And that's Jesus' teaching. Jesus is there in that verse. I think Jesus is setting the record straight. He's telling us how he operates. And I think by implication, uh, how he not only drives out demons, but how he performs all of his miracles. It's by the Spirit of God. And it's all 
as a sign that the kingdom of God had come upon them. So the exorcism, uh, the healing miracles were signs uh, that the kingdom of light was breaking into the kingdom of darkness, that the kingdom of God was breaking in to the kingdom uh, that was under the control, as David was uh, saying, of the God of this, of the God of this world. And it was the, the miracles themselves and all of these exorcisms and so on were, were, were signs of the beginnings of the triumph of the kingdom of God over the kingdom of darkness. And Jesus uh, seems to teach quite clearly here that it is in and by his spirit-empowered humanity that he engages with the kingdom of darkness. And that shouldn't really surprise us, because that's the way it had to be. Is it not? Jesus, that's what we, uh, Jesus was doing here and throughout his ministry. He was beginning to engage in the battle again. Um, uh, it's just wonderful the way things come together. I had no idea what David was going to be speaking up, uh, uh, on, um, but it's very much related to, to what I'm speaking about here. Uh, Jesus was beginning to engage uh, in the battle that would bring about the reversal of what had happened uh, at the beginning of human experience in the Garden of Eden uh, as a result of uh, the work of that old serpent, the devil. Beguiling humanity in Adam. Beguiling humanity into them embracing the path of disobedience. So instead of listening to the voice of the Eternal Father and hearing the voice of the Eternal Father, they listened to another voice. <coughs> and so it was essential for human uh, salvation, for the salvation of humanity, that a true human being reverse the process. No use if God doesn't. That doesn't save human beings. It's got to be a human. And that's what Jesus does. In Genesis 3, the serpent had found his way into the garden paradise of Eden. Uh, and once you get into studying Genesis 3, you'll uh, recognize that it's, it, it, it's often described nowadays as a, a kind of sanctuary, a proto-sanctuary, an early sanctuary. Uh, the place where God walked with his people, with his family, in the cool of the day. That's in the ruach of the day, could be in the spirit. God walking in the spirit with his people uh, in the garden. Uh, it's a place that by its very nature was alive. It was filled with life, with an abundance of life. It was a garden uh, through which uh, a river flowed. Uh, we might call that the, the river of God, the river of life, intended uh, it flew, flowed out of the garden, uh, intended, uh, I think, to bring the life of the garden into the rest of the world and into the rest of creation. Uh, but because of the work of that ancient serpent, the devil, the father of lies, in that garden, the end of Genesis 3, humanity in Adam found themselves outside the garden, separated from the tree of life separated from the life of the garden. And I think as Paul teaches us in Romans 6, slaves to sin and slaves to that old serpent, um, the devil. Romans 6, 16, don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey. As long as Adam and Eve uh, were listening to the voice of the Eternal Father, they were children of the, heaven, of the Heavenly Father, of the Eternal Father. Once they started listening to another powerful voice, uh, the, the voice of the Father of Lies, they became part of a, a different family. They became servants and slaves to, to a different ruler, to a different father. I think that's part of what Paul is saying there in Romans 6. Or just to use the imagery uh, that Jesus himself uses in, in Matthew 12 here in verse 29, uh, they became possessions <laughs> of the strong man. 
And God's plan for the salvation of humanity required that another man should come, another Adam should come, to be the, the leader, the head of a new humanity, a new humanity that would be rescued from the clutches of the strong man and transferred back into the family of the Eternal Father, becoming children of God. And all of that happens through the work of liberation, of freeing from captivity, of redemption, of salvation, whatever words you want to use. Some of you will know John Henry Newman's great hymn, Praise to the Holiest in the Height, picks up uh, the, the theology of this in some of the verses. So loving wisdom of our God, when all was sin and shame, second Adam to the fight. And to the rescue came a wisest love that flesh and blood. This is the second Adam he's talking about. Flesh and blood which did in Adam fail should strive against the foe, should strive and should prevail. I think in that hymn uh, Newman has a clear sense uh, of the need for humanity to be redeemed through the obedience of a human being, of a flesh and blood second Adam, and that that uh, redemption could only happen through battle, through conflict, the very conflict that uh, David was talking about earlier, through, through striving a spiritual battle against the foe, a battle in which uh, Jesus, again to use his own words here from um, Matthew 12 and verse 20, a battle in which Jesus goes into action and ties up the strong man so that his possessions can be taken from him. <coughs> and that's exactly how the Gospels present the work and ministry of, 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 of Jesus, isn't it? From the very outset of that ministry, uh, which began in earnest at the time of his baptism uh, by John at the River Jordan, Jesus is presented as a spirit-endowed uh, person, a spirit-filled, spirit-empowered, flesh-and-blood man. Just as David in the Old Testament, 1 first, uh, uh, first Samuel 16, just as David was endowed with a spirit, <coughs> and um, just as he was endowed with a spirit from the time of his anointing uh, onwards, so it was with Jesus. Jesus, who's in the line of David, of course, that's part of the reason why the genealogy is there in Matthew chapter 1. Um, Jesus, who is the son of David, the Messianic king, is anointed by the Spirit at the River Jordan. And we read of that in Matthew 3, 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And we remember that the Son of God is one of the, uh, the main titles applied to David and to the kings on his line from Old Testament times. And I think it's most likely primarily in that sense that we're to understand the words of the Father at the baptism of Jesus. This is my son whom I love. Second Samuel chapter 7. It's the words from, from uh, the covenant that God made with David. Uh, the Father is saying, this is my messianic king. I love him. <coughs> and what was the very next thing that happened to Jesus? The opening verse of the chapter 4 of Matthew. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Uh, you notice that was led is a passive verb. Some of you might not know what passive verbs are. Um, uh, others of us are old enough to have had uh, um, grammar in school. Um, but uh, the difference between a passive verb and an active verb is that in the passive, somebody else does the action. So Jesus was led. So who is doing the action? Who's the active one? Who's in control of this situation? It's not Jesus, but the, the Spirit 
with whom Jesus has just been uh, anointed. The Spirit acting as Jesus' guide. The Spirit leading him. The Spirit is the shepherd of Jesus, leading him out into the desert. And it's the Spirit who is leading him uh, right into this encounter with uh, the opposition. So that there is this clash of the kingdoms that happens immediately. That is to begin there in the de uh, desert. Mark in his gospel, it's one of the interesting things uh, when you're looking at a story to look at the way the different in the, in the Gospels, in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, look at the different ways in which uh, the Gospel writers speak, the, the language they use. Uh, do they change language? Why do they change language? Mark, uh, in his account, a much briefer account of this, uh, in Mark 1 and verse 12, he says that immediately the Spirit sent him into the desert. Well, that's the way the NIV translates it, and it's a lame uh, translation. Uh, um, it's a very strong word um, in, in, in the original Greek, and the, and the old AB translation, I think, gets, uh, gets it when it uses the word dry, uh, drove him. The Spirit of God drove Jesus. It's actually the word that very often in the rest of the Gospels is used for, it's the normal word for, for exorcism, cast out. It's the word that's used for casting out the demons. Uh, so the Spirit thrusts Jesus out. He impels him out. Onto his mission. It's really saying, this is what you came for. Get into battle. Go for him. Uh, so straight into the, into the battle, into the water, into engagement with Satan. And that's not new. It's just following the pattern that's set down in the Old Testament. For the kings in particular. 1 Samuel 10. Saul is anointed as the first king of Israel. People who are grumbling. Some are, oh, I don't know, he's going to be a good king, you know. Uh, so, the very next chapter, what does God do? Uh, he sends them out, empowered by the Spirit, leads the armies of Israel to victory over the Ammonites, and everyone says, Saul is king. Victory in the battle against the opposition confirms the kingship. That's what's happening here with, with Jesus. Uh, just after uh, that experience uh, in, in 1 Samuel, um, in, in chapter 16, verse 13, you've got the, the anointing of David to be the next king of Israel. We read that from that day onwards, from the day of his anointing with oil, from that day onwards, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. What's the very next thing that happens? What's uh, 1 Samuel 17 about? You learned it in Sunday school. The encounter between David and Goliath. Uh, so immediately, um, he's uh, confronting the Philistine giant, Goliath. He's, he's got Saul trembling in his, in his boots. He's got everybody in the Philistine, uh, in the Israelite army trembling in, the, in their shoes. And David, the spirit empowered David, goes out against Goliath and defeats him. So the mark is on him. Yes, this is the next king. Which makes Saul jealous of him and so on. And so we find something similar in the experience of Jesus here. The spirit anointed, spirit filled, spirit empowered man. Jesus Christ is thrust <coughs> by the spirit of God into conflict with the devil. Where does the conflict take place? In the desert. And I think that's the context Appropriate for the prince of demons. <clears throat> the father of lies. The initial conflict between human beings uh, and Satan took place in a totally different environment. A luscious garden full of life. Well, that's the appropriate context for the eternal father. He's the living God. With him is the fountain of life, uh, Psalm 36 tells us. But this conflict takes place in a territory that is the extreme opposite of, of the garden. It spells death. It's the place that spells death. The desert. And I think part of what's being portrayed there is that the second or the last Adam engages uh, with Satan on Satan's ground. In the heart of Satan's territory. 
And this period of testing and temptation in the wilderness um, was a, a, a conflict in which there's a total contrast with Genesis 3. The second Adam did not fail. The second Adam remained obedient to the Father. And so we read in Matthew 4.11, uh, the devil left him. <coughs> the Luke adds uh, in his account the words, until an opportune time. <coughs> He's going to come back. Not one battle. Uh, the warfare wasn't over. Uh, the warfare was actually just beginning uh, there. But what we find happening as, as a result of Jesus' steadfast stand against Satan in the desert on uh, in Satan's territory is that the kingdom of darkness from that point onwards uh, begins to lose its power. And so you see Jesus, the king, coming in and demons begin to be cast out and the demons recognize the king uh, and healings begin to happen. Men and women begin to respond to King Jesus uh, to his call upon their lives. And I think we're to understand that everything that Jesus did in his ministry was, did, uh, was done by him as a man through the empowering of the Spirit, through the enabling of the Spirit. And that's why uh, in Luke's account, in chapter 4 and verse 14, he tells us that immediately after the, the, the temptation, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. In the power of the Spirit. And he goes on to tell us immediately that I uh, began to preach and he went into the synagogue uh, at, in his hometown of Nazareth. Uh, he opened the scroll of Isaiah, uh, began reading the opening verses of Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. Rolled up the scroll and said, that's it. That's me. Today it's fulfilled in your hearing. So whenever Jesus preached, he did that as a man under the anointing of the Spirit and in the power of the Spirit. Jesus preached in the power of the Spirit. Jesus healed the sick in the power of the Spirit. Um, and returning to Matthew 12 and uh, verse 28, Jesus drove out demons. Not by his deity, but in his humanity, by the power of the Spirit. And all of these wonders were signs that the kingdom of God was, was breaking through um, the darkness. Uh, Peter said something like that to, to Cornelius in Acts 10. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. As a result of which he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil. Because God was with him. You notice, not because he was God, but because God was with him in the power of the Spirit. And of course, uh, it was by the same empowering of the Spirit that Jesus, uh, the second or the last Adam, was able to enter into what <laughs> became the, uh, the ultimate battle of his warfare with Satan and the kingdom of darkness. And that, of course, was on the cross. Writer to the Hebrews, chapter 9 and verse 14, teaches us that it was through the eternal spirit that Christ offered himself unblemished to God on the cross. So you imagine Christ is there on the cross. The physical pain, through all the physical pain, through all the weakness, the physical weakness that that he, he felt, he experienced in his body, through all the, the mental um, and psychological and emotional trauma that that cross was for him, to say nothing of the incomprehensible, utterly new experience for him, the utterly unique experience of complete and utter spiritual, a sense of spiritual abandonment and darkness, where he can't, for the first time in his life, can't call God his Father. Through all of that, he kept on the path of obedience. Kept just nodding to the Father. Yes. 
saying yes to God. He kept offering himself. It wasn't anyone taking away his life from him. He was offering his life. <clears throat> he was pouring out his life. Offering himself unblemished to God. How did he do it? It wasn't because he was the son of God. Hebrews tells us it was through the eternal spirit. The eternal spirit kept strengthening him. Kept supporting him. Kept encouraging him. The comforter came beside him and comforted and encouraged him. I'm sure it was ever so gently urging him just to keep going. Keep going, Jesus. Keep going, Jesus. So the Spirit, I think, gave him everything that he needed to take his next breath. And his next breath. And his next breath, even if it was weaker than the previous one. Until there were no more breaths to take. Empowered by the Spirit of God, the second and last Adam won the war and cried its finish. <coughs> Victory cry. Battle's over. Obedient. Unto death. Even the death of the cross. Colossians 2.15. Paul says, having disarmed the powers and authorities. Where did he do that? On the cross. Made a public spectacle of them. Triumphing over them in the cross. And it would appear that that wasn't the end of the ministry of the Spirit of God in Jesus' experience. He seems to have had a, a ministry in raising him from the dead as well, Romans 1, 4. And also actually in, in teaching the apostles between the resurrection and the ascension, Acts 1 and 2. This isn't new teaching and giving. It was standard teaching in the 1600s. But then part of our problem is that we don't read some of the theology of the, uh, the Puritans. Uh, Puritan scholar uh, John Owen. And this is the way he understood the work of, uh, of Christ and the role of, uh, of the Spirit in that work. And uh, you need to read uh, uh, John Owen on the, the, work of, uh, the work of the Spirit. And, uh, not, not just because uh, William's here today, but uh, um, <laughs> Christian Focus have done a kind of uh, updated version and more readable version uh, of uh, his two books on the, on the Holy Spirit, um, uh, recently published. Worth getting a hold of that. <clears throat> just, uh, I'm sure I've gone over my a lot of time part of the course the, the principles are to do <laughs> just as we close I want to ask the question so what does it make any difference what's the relevance of this piece of biblical theology for us today well, just, just a few thoughts um, I suppose the, the really significant thing is that every one of us is a Christian. Every Christian in this world is baptized and anointed with the very same spirit that was upon Jesus. And lived with Jesus. Actually, not just from his baptism uh, to the end of his life, but was there from the beginning of his life. Uh, Matthew 3, 11, John the Baptist. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Romans 8, 9. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong uh, to Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. 
We were all given the one spirit to drink. Every Christian has the anointing. That's what the Bible says. First John. We have the anointing. And just following on from that. We are taught by the spirit who accompanied Jesus. Throughout the whole of his life. Throughout the whole of his ministry. And throughout those final hours on the cross as well. He knows what it took to get the man Jesus Christ. Through every temptation. And through the final traumas. To the place of victory. And that's the spirit who's in you. And that's the spirit who's in me. The spirit who has the ability to do that. To get us right through to the end. Be of good courage. As David was saying. And uh, a lot of the teaching of Jesus in John 14 to uh, 17 uh, comes in here. The counsellor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. The Spirit of truth will testify about me. He'll guide you into all truth. And so on. And we are led by the very same Spirit. We're led, as Jesus was led by the Spirit into his ministry, we are led by the Spirit into our Christian lives, <coughs> into the ministries that we are given as well. We're led by the very same Spirit. And what we have to do, of course, is to keep in step with the Spirit, as Jesus did. And we're empowered by the same Spirit who empowered Christ. <clears throat> we're empowered to witness. You will receive the power of the Holy Spirit uh, uh, when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be witnesses. You will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. We're empowered to preach uh, and teach and speak the word of God boldly um, if that's our particular calling. So that, uh, as was the case with Paul's preaching to the Thessalonians, our gospel um, might come to people not simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit, bringing that deep conviction that uh, this is not a man talking, this is, this is heaven talking, this is God talking. This is of the Spirit. This is of the kingdom of, of light, breaking through the kingdom of darkness. We're empowered to work whatever miracles God intends to work through us. Empowered to do the work to which he calls us. Empowered to withstand the assaults of Satan. He will teach you, he will teach me everything we need. And give us everything we need to take us through every temptation. Everyone. He gained all of that experience with Jesus. Nobody was ever tempted as much as Jesus. The Spirit knows what it takes for a human being. To come through all of that. <clears throat> He's with us. Uh, empowered by the Spirit in our weakness as well. Romans 8. Not my time <coughs> and empowered by the Spirit ultimately. To rise from the dead. So how did Jesus work miracles? <coughs> he did so as the second Adam. Uh, in his humanity, empowered by the Spirit. And that's why that story is such an encouragement to us. Um, opportunity for uh, any questions. Um, uh, for Hector or uh, for a member of the staff. Um, or indeed yourselves if you have answers. But uh, we the family students quite like to have an opportunity to, um, uh, to discuss the paper for any other sort of theological issues or uh, they'd like to chat about it at this time. And now's your opportunity, so I just want to give you a little warning beforehand. So I've just had uh, time to think of some. Um, so over to you. Anybody who'd like to ask a question? I've got a question to David. Oh. My eyes suggest. <laughs> That to avoid the 
dangers of stepping out the door, you simply tap into an app. What place do you see apps have enhancing our faith? And I should hastily add, I'm a techo freak. I do not necessarily embrace technology, but that's the question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's nice um, and safe in the house just by tapping into the app. Yeah. But that's not going to help. Yeah. Or will it? I mean, it's a it's a massive question, and, and something I've been thinking about recently. Just, um, I, I guess a very, a, very a, a, a quite a usual response certainly that I've heard before in the church is that, you know, all these things are kind of neutral and, and you can use them for good and you can use them for evil. So the internet or apps or whatever. Neutral things, you know, and we just use it for good or use it for evil. Um, and I guess I, I would have said that myself a, a, a while ago, but now I'm not so sure. I think, um, I'm not saying that we shouldn't engage with technology, but I think... It's fascinating to me that even some of the founders of, of Facebook are now speaking about its damaging effects, not on individuals necessarily, although that's included, but on the whole fabric of, of how human beings interact. So, so it's a massive question to think about. Um, I, I think your point, you've linked it specifically to, to going out of the, the door and how... I guess maybe what you're getting at is that sometimes we can live a kind of virtual life um, rather than a real life. I, I think this is one of the areas where I, I would say, and I, I, I can't say I've thought this through in, you know, as much as I should have done, but I think this is one of the dangers of technology. Um, it removes us from the fullness and richness of human experience. So just to take, if my son ever finds out about this, he'll be really annoyed. <laughs> um, ju ju just to take, um, my son is, is, is really pretty good at basketball. I mean, all fathers think that this is really good at <laughs> But he plays for the Highland Bears in the 17s and 18s. And he's, there's a court, funnily enough, right just next to our house is a basketball court and he's he's out there a lot but he's also on his xbox playing nba 2k 18 or whatever um a lot of the time and i think there are other kids who are playing nba 2k 18 and never go on a basketball court um, now you might not think there's a problem with that and maybe in its place there isn't but actually if you just take that as an example technology can remove us from the richness and the challenge and the danger of genuine, real human existence. And maybe that's what you're getting at, that, we, that, that as Christians we can, we can be engaging a lot with apps and social media and things like that, but how much are we actually engaging with people? And you might say, well, we're still engaging with people through social media. But you're not engaging with people who are not on social media, people who haven't got the personalities to put themselves out there, a lot of people who are poor, afflicted, struggling with addictions. Um, and you're not engaging necessarily with the people who live next door to you, the real flesh and blood people who in a, in a real flesh and blood person, as the text has been saying, encounter Christ, who was a real flesh and blood person. So, I mean, there's so much you could say, but I guess I would affirm that there's a danger of us not living in the real world, not embracing the risk, the danger, the adventure of genuine human life, and convincing ourselves that a kind of life lived through technology is just as valid as that. And I would say, not that we shouldn't do it, because I use technology myself, but it, we should see the greater uh, authenticity of flesh and blood, face to face, meeting, action, speaking, living. So, I was wondering if uh, Hector could say something about if there is any difference between anointing and being filled. <laughs> 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 I 
<laughs> what, what, what you were saying to us is that every believer is anointed with the, with the Spirit of God. Okay. Yeah. Then, well, can I have a go at that? Um, Absolutely, I mean, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we do it systematically, you know, that was going to be my standby. Yeah. <laughs> So, if you think of the anointing as in the 1, the one, one Corinthians passage that we're all anointed, where Paul was using it to sort of unify the church to point out that they all have the Spirit, um, that is pretty different from where the Bible uses filled with the Spirit, because um, uh, individuals are filled with the Spirit for a task. So, for Peter, I think he's filled three times in, in Acts alone. So, there's obviously, there is something different in the biblical language going on there. Um, but the biblical language then ends up into church systematics. And gets Different, different traditions use the words differently. Um, uh, so yes, I would say there is there is a difference. If, if the one thing's meant to be that one-off one experience, all Christians share the spirit, connected with regeneration and all the rest of it, compared to fillingness that's used in the Bible, which was a good thing for a cast. I mean, one of the things I was going to sort of say, I mean, the way I think John Owen does it, and so we were speaking on and Sinclair Ferguson afterwards. They note in the spirit in Jesus' life two folds or three grades, I think is the way some people use it, uh, anointing. Um, his birth, if you're looking in Luke, Luke 1. You speak up a little. Sorry, bit. Yeah, Luke 1, uh, yeah. I think it's probably, yeah. Luke chapter 1, verse 35, talks of the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary um, at, at the conception of, of Jesus. Um, so, Smeaton's, and um, I think Owen to sees that as a first first act of spirit in the life of Jesus. Then there's the uh, uh, the baptism and, and the testing in the desert. And then Acts uh, 2.33 in the speech of Pentecost where it talks about Christ uh, ascending to the right hand of the Father and being given the spirit to pour out on the church, to give the spirit to the church as, as another stage in Jesus' experience of the spirit. Um, so in that sort of case you see perhaps that's it's not quite the same as filling with the Spirit, but the fact that when we talk about the Spirit coming into someone's life, there is a difference from one all for everyone, and then equipping for particular tasks. Donald McLeod has, a, Donald McLeod has quite a, a point on it in his book on the Holy Spirit, which was done many years ago. Uh, just, we have to remember that the Holy Spirit is a person. We, we sometimes think it's he's an influence that he is a person and that's a very I think that's a very helpful for me if I have the Holy Spirit as I trust that you have I have a person mm -hmm. of course the relationship will change and things will change mm -hmm. as you would be like I just wanted to uh, thank you Hector for making that very clear emphasis on the fact that everything Jesus did in the course of his ministry, particularly his resistance of temptation, was done as a person just like us, as a man. Because perhaps like some of us, I don't know, but I've often fallen into the trap, the back of your mind to think, oh, but he was God. They did all this because he was God. What this miracle did that miracle? But in fact, we brought it out extremely clearly in a way that I hadn't really even considered to that extent that he had done, he did everything he did uh, as a man empowered by the Spirit. So, just wanted to say thank you for that very full treatment, very helpful treatment. Indeed. That's basically why I did it, because I, I think <laughs> most, most Christians I come across mm -hmm. think that, um, and, and, and they would think that Jesus was able to do that because he was he was the son of God and uh, might even call uh, what I'm just saying today heretical. <coughs> Conversely, thinking about that, to think, have the idea that you had to do back your Bible, a lot of people do, but it's actually, uh, the early church is a kind of heresy, it was it's called deceitism. Oh, that right. the, the, the Jesus, I mean the extreme form, Jesus just appeared to be a man, really the son of God. And, there's a bit of a, a, a step in that direction, you know, because you're all making the same thing. He, I'm sure he's a man, but he wasn't really just a man, he was God doing all this stuff. Yeah. Um, and that 
takes away the reality of his um, uh, humanity. Oh, oh. Confess my hairship. <laughs> 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 Throw me out now. <laughs> <laughs> I was just listening to your interest and robbed my answer in the heart of your question. <coughs> that obviously, the, the miracles recorded in the Bible talk Peter out in, in Acts. You know, I know there's a whole debate about is there such a thing as modern miracles. And probably in a pastoral sense, most of us come across miracles in the sense of, say, a sick child who's terminally ill and having to deal with that pastoral situation and praying for it. And saying, are we, in some ways, overstating what we expect by miracles in the sense of the terminally ill sick child compared to say the fact I cut my finger yesterday and it heals up automatically it's just being common <coughs> so where do you stand on this type of modern miracle argument mm. is there such a thing why did it keep that and why, was it just commonplace that they didn't also record the miracles after that to the apostles I'm not sure, quite sure what your question, what your question is I, are you saying are there miracles today? Yes. Do miracles happen today? How, 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 do we, how do we see this from modern mir miracles today? Some people would argue that miracles stopped in the Acts of the Apostles. Yeah. I think there, there are some helpful things to say that it's clear that there are miracles <coughs> in the Old and New Testament. But if you actually look at them, when do they occur? Uh, most of them occur at very significant moments. Uh, so that's why I, I, I raised the, uh, the person of Moses. Uh, he, he was um, a very specific time uh, and what was being enacted through him leading uh, the, the people of Israel at the time of, of what became the great saving event of, of the Old Testament. <clears throat> uh, and the other, the other um, time when you see Multiple miracles is the other example I took from the Old Testament was um, uh, Elijah and Elisha, and and there really it, it's like just it's it's a clash of the kingdoms. It's the future of the kingdom of God uh, in Old Testament times was was uh, was at risk. It was ready to collapse, and you've got it in that. Uh, Elijah uh, on Mount Carmel, he asked the people, um, you know, who is God? Is Yahweh God or is Baal God? And this is the covenant people of God. And they uh, don't really know. Uh, so that's, that's uh, the kingdom of God is in crisis. <coughs> the people of God don't know who God is. And so that's part of the thing of, of the explanation of, of the miracles of that particular time. And with Jesus, of course, it's, it's, it's a new covenant. It's a new start. It's, it's a new uh, inbreaking of, uh, of the kingdom. And they are signs of confirmation. Um, but I, I, I mean, one of the reasons I read the, uh, the, the, the passages from the... From the New Testament epistles is that just in the passing, uh, Paul kind of alludes to the fact that there are uh, the Spirit is working miracles to you. James five. Um, so God, I, I think these are for the life of the church. I mean, we don't want to go into a, a debate about cessationism uh, and all of that, but um, I think we, we have tended to kind of glaze over some, some of these things. So, so yes, um, I believe God does work miracles. Uh, at the same time, you know, I, there are lots of issues and problems about a lot of the, the stuff that is supposed to be miracles happening, you know, and so on. So. I think you're one of those sort of things. I mean, I thought your question was going to be, what is a miracle? So, question how do you define a miracle that makes quite a difference mm -hmm. and we tend to sort of think in sort of philosophical miracle type thing as a defines the laws of nature or something like that but that's a fairly modern way of thinking if you look at in the bible it is as Peck was saying that generally these are wonders or <laughs> signs or mighty works um, and they're there to for a revelatory purpose to show something god is doing something so so they're there pointing to something else not uh, something in themselves so uh, that's the sort of function they have. 
Um, and I think even the secessionist sort of discussion, it's not really a question whether miracles still exist or not. It's whether the particular gifts that were in the church or roles within the church still exist. Um, so, you know, secessionism is miracles disappeared. Just to contribute that I've always understood that to be absolutely not that there was a specific time when the apostles were, um, you know, given gifts of healing and after that time was over, we absolutely do not ex have miraculous healing or uh, these were, you know, the gift of tongues, the gift of healing, there were very specific instances of miracles which after the apostles, uh, after the apostolic era, that was the end of that. Um, right, well, so, 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 so I mean, that, yeah, I mean, there's a separation of gift and miracle. <laughs> they're, they're not the same. Yeah. The gift of, uh, of miracles is uh, something different from God working miraculous at any time. I think if anyone's aware of what God is doing in the Islamic world today, um, I mean, I think that that's an instant. Um, I've spoken to people who have been on the field and, and experienced the, the power of God. And because of the, because that that's operating in a society that that is open to the spiritual realm, um, uh, God manifests Himself in ways in which people who have a spirituality but not the right spirituality recognize this is God, you know. So things happen where they recognize this is God, but that's the confirmation for them to listen to the gospel, to listen to the words of Jesus. Um, so it's, it's something along, along those lines. It, 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 number, numbers 11 uh, is an example, I think, of that, where um, Moses is clearly the man upon whom the Spirit comes. and uh, 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 Not upon whom the Spirit comes. We never read of when the Spirit comes upon Moses. The, mid the Spirit is on Moses permanently, it seems. And... Uh, Life is getting too difficult for him with all the, 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 the judging that he has to do among the people. And so uh, God says, set apart 70 elders. Uh, and um, we read that the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God uh, from um, Moses uh, divides onto these 70 elders and they prophesy. That's the word that's used. Um, but they never did, did again. It was a one-off experience, uh, and I understand that as uh, something that the people looking at um, saw and, and, and would say to themselves, right, this is God. Uh, uh, this is a confirmation from God. It's a confirmatory type of thing. Um, and it was a one-off for that, for that particular year. So I think that kind of thing is happening again and again and again. Uh, is Islamic world um, visions and dreams. Yeah, I think we'll have people uh, who haven't had the Bible, you know. And, um, but I've heard it in, in, in this country as well. People who have had no background. I heard it from first from a, a free church minister over um, Carl Malison over in um, in the 1980s in Lewis. Um, a, a woman from um, traveling people background. Uh, and she came to Callum and she said, God is, God is saying this to me in dreams. You know, this is what God said to me last night in a dream. And Callum, uh, he, he was uh, explaining it to me and he said, well, it, it was just, you know, Revelation 3 or it was Matthew 15. Or, um, so, didn't have a Bible. She wasn't reading the Bible, but the Spirit of God was pouring the Bible into her, into her dream. I, I think that kind of thing is, is likely to happen, where the kingdom of God is moving into, a, breaking into a new territory, into a new area, that sort of thing. Yeah, so it's a bit of a biblical thing you pointed out earlier. Yeah, so um, I think we're supposed to finish at one, but um, since the text took his time, we'll give a bit of extra time. <laughs> um, uh, one more question. Before you get no, it was Hector said, actually, it's my observation that where miracles and, and gifts are seen is where the church doesn't have this. You see it in China, more recently perhaps, and you see it in Africa. Our brothers and sisters in Malawi, for example, would have no doubt that God gives, gives gifts to his church, which include 
miracles of healing and so on. And they see it every day. Or they see it a lot. Can I, can I just make <coughs> one final request of David? Uh, that quotation you came out with uh, from Ian Proven, would it be possible for you to make that available? Um, on either. social media. Pardon? On social media. Anyway, <laughs> 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 like. <laughs> I meant to anybody that wants it, whether it could be emailed down to everybody or, I don't know, just uh, put up somewhere. Uh -huh. I'll put it on my blog. Um, uh, yeah, um, website. Give it, give it to Marina and she can tap yeah. it. She'll put something on about today or something like that. Oh, thank you. I was just going to have, what, what, uh, if I can, just one last thing to ask Hector. Because I think may, maybe a lot of people are thinking it. And somebody, I think Hector himself mentioned it. It's quite common <coughs> in the church for the miracles of Christ to be seen very strongly as a mark of his divinity, his, his deity. Um, Christianity Explored makes a massive play on that, you know, um, so it's, you know, it's that common. So what, what would you just say briefly to kind of reassure, you know, those who might think, oh, you know, this is striking at the kind of evidence for the deity of Christ? <laughs> Oh. There, there is your man. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, w one of the things I did when I was preparing f uh, for this was, was look just at what Bruce Millen mm -hmm. uh, had to say, because my memory of um, his, his book when it originally came out was similar to what Christianity mm -hmm. Explorer was saying, but, but actually, um, um, certainly the new edition that I, mm -hmm. I looked at um, kind of m moves away from that. Right, okay. um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, it does still, but it doesn't do it directly. It's mm -hmm. not like miracle must be God because you look at um, all the Old Testament examples. And, uh, you just can't argue that way. <laughs> but it, a miracle is where God is working and, and mm -hmm. revealing Himself. So you could ask, well, what is God revealing in, in, in this situation? Mm -hmm. And it's not as if that, that's the only evidence of deity of Christ. I mean, there's just masses of data if you look at it. Um, so it works in the same sort of way as, um, you know. Uh, Christians worshiping Christ. You can only worship God. It's an indirect argument. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. Innis, would you be so good to uh, give thanks to the food in a second? Uh, just have to explain the process. Uh, so, what we do here is uh, after St. Grace, there's food through in classroom two. It's a buffet arrangement, so feel free to go and. Uh, some food on the plates that you'll find there and wander back in here and eat or wherever. Okay. Yes. Let's put it together. Heavenly Father, we thank you again uh, for this wonderful teaching this morning that we received from you. We are being made aware again of the two kingdoms. And thank you, Father, that we are being blessed and by your grace that we are part of your kingdom. Encourage us, Father, again to keep on stepping out into this world, although it might be dangerous for us, Father. But to be a witness to you and to your kingdom. Father, we also thank you for the spirit you gave Jesus to give us and so that we have you as, as the Holy Spirit with us as we step out. Thank you that we are empowered by you to be able to do that. Father, we also pray that you will bless us now as we are continuing to have fellowship. And thank you for the food that we are about to enjoy. And bless that. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.